Hello, I'm Jorge Getoso. Welcome to a new program from Washington. On today's show, the new relations between Cuba and the U.S. Our guest, Peter Conblue, director of the Cuba Documentation Project at the National Security Archive. Mr. Conblue, a warm welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to be here again. Peter, a new edition of your book, this is your book, Back Channel to Cuba, is coming out with a um, comprehensive new epilogue. And, uh, and also, the book is published in Mexico with a new title in Spanish, Diplomacia Encubierta, Historia Secreta de Negociaciones entre Washington y La Habana. What is the most relevant issue that you bring up in this new epilogue? The new edition of the book in English and in Spanish. Uh, William Leo Grand and I have told the story of how Barack Obama and Raul Castro secretly negotiated a reconciliation between the United States and Cuba. It's a detailed story. It's an amazing story. How it's many a, pages? Well, it's about 50 pages in the book, 15,000 new words. Uh, we were investigative reporters. We went out, we interviewed the negotiators on the, on the U.S. side. We um, uh, found all the different players uh, who were involved. Uh, and um, we uh, almost did everything but talk to the president. Uh, but uh, it's an amazing, fascinating story. It's, it's a model of what uh, negotiations can do uh, when two presidents want to talk to each other. Raul Castro once talked about building bridges between the United States uh, and Cuba and with both countries walking across them, getting close enough so that they could shake hands. And, and the United States and Cuba are really at that point now. And from the U.S. government standpoint, which part of the negotiations were taking place through the State Department and which ones through the White House? There's a major revelation in this a new edition of our book, Jorge, and that is that Obama's State Department began secretly negotiating with uh, Cuban foreign ministry officials in 2010. And for two years, between 2010 and 2012, two State Department officials working directly under Hillary Clinton, uh, her Chief of Staff Cheryl Mills and her uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Latin America, uh, Julissa Reynoso, um, uh, actually uh, negotiated with foreign ministry officials from Cuba. They were focused, they had negotiations in Haiti, in the Dominican Republic, and in subterranean bars in New York City. Uh, and the discussion that they focused on was a prisoner exchange, uh, freeing Alan Gross, this USAID contractor who was in prison in Cuba, in exchange for uh, the Cuban spies, those five spies. Uh, or the heroes that's been calling Cuba. Right, the héroes, as they are called in, in Cuba. Um, and they went back and forth and back and forth on this issue for two years, made very little progress, uh, and, um, and it basically came to a halt, those negotiations. But after Obama's reelection, he basically decided he was going to make Cuba a top priority for his second term. And he called in his top aides at the White House, and he said, look, I want you to run a new play. He used this football metaphor. I want you to run a new play on Cuba. Tell the Cubans we're ready to talk. And through these back-channel mechanisms that had already been established uh, with the State Department, um, the uh, White House was able to contact the Cubans, get a positive response, and set up a series of meetings uh, in Canada uh, and elsewhere, nine meetings over the course of two years, culminating in an amazing sit-down meeting that lasted a couple of days at the Vatican, overseen by the Pope uh, and his top Vatican aides, uh, to bring these two sides together in a final accord. What was that accord? There would be a prisoner exchange. Alan Gross and a very high-level CIA mole who had been arrested in Cuba and been in prison there for 20 years, Rolando Sorraf Trajillo, in return for what was now three Cuban spies, uh, since two of them had already gone back to Cuba. Uh, and that opened the door for the second part of this major announcement that the United States and Cuba would now normalize diplomatic relations. That was all worked out, finalized at the Vatican in October of 2014, just really a few months ago. I mean, uh, not very long ago. And uh, like one month before they were announcing the idea of reestablishing diplomatic relations. And now uh, we have had the restoration of diplomatic relations. We have an ambassador in Cuba. We have an ambassador in Washington. The, what were called the interest sections are now full embassies. The stars and stripes flies over the embassy in Havana and the Cuban flag flies uh, 
over the Cuban Embassy here on 16th Street in Washington. Uh, and the two countries are now beyond that. They are looking at uh, some of the normalization of full relations issues now, normal mail service, uh, normal talks on migration, uh, environmental discussions. Travel. Uh, exactly. And, uh, and eventually they'll get to the really hard issues that have plagued U.S.-Cuban relations for a long time, including uh, what to do about Guantanamo Base, which is sovereign Cuban territory that Cuba would like returned uh, to its control, uh, what to do about the whole issue of compensation for expropriated properties, what to do about the embargo, uh, hmm, which of course is a, issue, a yeah. pressing issue. The blockade, as they call it. But quick question, Peter. Those second period of two years, because you mentioned the State Department and then the, the White House, the White House was taking place of meetings, they were doing the meetings secretly? This was all done, as we call it in the book, back channel, behind the scenes, behind closed doors. This was secret diplomacy, and it had to stay secret, because if the right wing in, in Congress and the Senate got a hold of it and started screaming, it would all be, it would be, all be over. Uh, and so it really had to be kept secret, and it was. It was a, a major accomplishment for the White House. And to keep it secret, they had to limit the amount of people who knew about it. And really, there was only a handful of people who knew. For example? Uh, well, uh, the two top negotiators, uh, Ricardo Suniga, who was the National Security Council specialist on Latin America, and Benjamin Rhodes, who was mm -hmm. Obama's speechwriter in the beginning and is now his deputy national security advisor. They were the two people most involved, most directly responsible for the success of these talks. But then there was Susan Rice, the national security advisor to the president, and Dennis McDonough, his chief of staff, and just a few other people. John Kerry knew, but uh, nobody else in the State Department knew until almost the very end. Uh, um, I don't think the Defense Department was told at all that this was going on. But that's the way you keep things secret in this town, in this country, in this world. In this you town have to especially. limit it to the, the need to know. You know that famous CIA expression compartmentalization of information and the White House kept this under wraps. It kept it away from the enemies of improved relations with Cuba and there are many in the Senate and the House and even in the State Department and other bureaucracies in the United States government. There are many. They kept this information away from them and they carried this out in secret and then they revealed this surprise to everybody on December 17th of last year. Announcing both presidents. Both presidents simultaneously on the national televisions of their respective countries saying we are now going to have normal diplomatic relations. I want to tell you, I was in Cuba on that day. And uh, how was it, it, the atmosphere, the, the, the reaction? Jubilation uh, among the people of Cuba for two reasons. One, their heroes were coming back. Fidel Castro had promised they'd come back, and Raul ha Castro had negotiated their return. And Raul was on television while I was watching that day saying, and we have to respectfully thank President Obama for releasing our three heroes. Uh, and then the second part of it was, of course, that the threat of U.S. intervention, of U.S. hostility, uh, the breach of relations was, was coming to an end. And many, many people in Cuba have high expectations that this is going to change fundamentally their daily lives, their economic livelihood, uh, better relations with the United States, uh, an end eventually to the embargo. And what do you think that was the real motivation of President Obama to do all this? You know, President Obama ran on a campaign in 2008, when he was first running for president, of talking uh, to hostile states. He told Hillary Clinton during the primaries, I will sit down with Raul Castro. And he meant it, and he did. I was in Panama uh, for the Summit of the Americas. Uh, weren't you there too? Yes. <laughs> I think I saw you there. And, um, uh, and he sat down with Raul Castro at that point. They had their first, uh, the first meeting. face to face meeting. Uh, it went very well. Um, you and I were both hanging around outside, waiting for them to come out. Uh, but I think he philosophically believed that this was a better approach. Uh, politically, internationally, uh, for U.S. policy. I think he has understood that the policy has literally been counterproductive, irrational, downright stupid for all these years, doesn't help Cubans, doesn't help the United States, and he was facing intense pressure from the rest of Latin America 
to normalize relations with Cuba. There was virtually a rebellion among the Latin American countries. So much so that they say that they were not going to participate in the Summit of the Americans if Cuba was right, right. to be there. The entire kind of inter-American system as it's organized was going to unravel uh, if Cuba wasn't brought back into the fold, if you will. And if the United States didn't like it, well then they were going to be ejected from the tent, as it were, uh, by uh, these other countries. So, And what will be the motivation of Raul Castro to try to reestablish relations with the U.S.? Well, Raul Castro had a number of uh, imperatives. One, he wanted to get these spies back. Um, they are men who have served under him in the military. When he was defense minister, he owed it to get them back. Two, he is in the middle of uh, a transition, of overseeing a transition in Cuba's economy. Uh, and for Cuba's future, in order to have what he calls sustainable socialism, Cuba has to get its economy going again. And he is in the, the slow process of privatizing significant parts of the economy. And they need foreign investment. That investment has been coming from other countries around the world. But really, the key investors are those Cuban Americans and U.S. businesses who were once in Cuba before. Uh, and need to see the embargo lifted in order to return again. Um, and he wants uh, more funding to come from exiles who live uh, uh, in Florida and other parts of the United States. Obama sees the same uh, argument. He has lifted now the ceiling on remittances from Cuban Americans who live in the United States to their relatives in Cuba. Uh, Raul has lifted all the bans on travel between Cuba and the United States. So we are talking about moving into a new era, and he understood that his country could not modernize without normal diplomatic relations, and that's his motivation. Who's winning more of the two, the U.S., Cuba? Well, that depends on what you feel like the objective is. Many people have come in and said, look, Obama's not getting anything for this because Cuba's not democratizing. Republics, Republicans. Republicans. Cuba's not democratizing. It's still a dictatorship. Well, the fact is that Cuba is changing in many ways. It's not changing politically, um, but it is changing economically. And I think many analysts believe that this will have an impact in the future on, on the political system. In any event, at the kind of daily level of Cuban citizens, their lives are slowly becoming less and less dependent on the state and more independent as they move into a private sector and start to build a middle class that's independent of the Cuban government. That's a little bit, or not a little bit, but uh, one of the issues that President Obama mentions that if uh, letting the private sector to have more resources, they could diminish the influence of the government. Well, that's, that happens, of course, when you go from a state-centric and monopolized system where everybody's dependent on the state for the livelihood to a system that's more of a mixed economy where people have small businesses, are able to earn a livelihood independent of the government. So basically, you know, for, many, for a growing number of people, which will expand when and if the embargo is lifted, um, there will be more businesses, there will be more jobs, and there will be more income that's independent of the state, and that can't help have an impact certainly on them as Cuban citizens, but also at some point certainly on, on, uh, on the political system. That's the argument that Obama sees, but, but let me be clear in terms of my own view. Secretary of State John Kerry went to Cuba last August 14th. He raised the, the American flag. flag. He made a, a major speech there along the Malecon uh, with um, at Cuban officials there and U.S. officials uh, and an international audience obviously watching carefully and his point was look you know we would like to see a democratic Cuba um, but uh, we understand that that's you know not what we're, what we're about we're not here to intervene any longer uh, this means a new era of coexistence with the Cubans um, we will stick to our philosophy and certainly urge and, and press for, for, for more democratic uh, more democracy in Cuba, but um, this is uh, about uh, mutual respect and, and coexistence. And, and that's, I think, what Obama is pursuing. The Cubans have a concern, of course, that Obama is not going to be they're president suspicious. forever. Well, they're suspicious. Yes, they see this. Some Cuban analysts and high officials see this as a, a Trojan horse, you know, to squeeze the Cubans with love. And, uh, and, then, and then precisely the whole thing could change with the next president of the U.S.? Well, of course, that's Cuba's concern, that, that the momentum that the Obama administration has built might be stopped or reversed even under a, 
Marco Rubio administration or a Jeb Bush administration. And Ted Cruz com and companies. Yeah, I, I can say today that I don't believe Ted Cruz will ever be president of the United States. But uh, Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio, you know, that's possible. And so, so Barack Obama is trying to build as much momentum and do as much as he can as president to basically secure this change in policy as one of the mainstays of his legacy as president of the United States. It has been opposition inside Cuba about the position of President Castro, and second, it's going to be a change of guard in Cuba eventually when, and if it happens, could it have an impact on the approach, on the close new relations with the U.S.? We're in a, an interesting and dynamic time in, in U.S.-Cuban relations. A lot is changing, and a lot is changing fast. People are going to Cuba. The Secretary of Commerce, Penny Pritzker, was just there. Mick Jagger was just there. Beyonce has traveled there. Uh, Secretary of State Kerry, of course, was there in August. I believe that Barack Obama will go to Cuba before the end of his term as president. Do of the you United really States. believe? I believe he will. I believe he will, unless you know, unless uh, some roadblocks uh, occur uh, that make it impossible for him to go, which is always possible. Um, I believe that both the Cubans and the Obama administration have an interest in consolidating these changes and building more pressure for the embargo to be lifted once and for all. So, you know, in that sense, I think most everybody under Raul Castro sees this as a positive thing. They want the embargo lifted. Uh, they want a situation that can't be reversed uh, by a Republican president. Um, and certainly on the U.S. side, this administration wants to do just about everything it can under executive orders and executive powers, everything that it controls to poke holes in the embargo uh, and kind of make it like a, a dam with holes in it. The water will rush in, the whole thing will eventually erode and collapse. In, in terms of the, uh, the Cuban exile community, is the lobby here in Washington playing a role in trying to modify uh, what could be the, the, the outside of this. And what about the new generations of the Cuban exile in Miami? What is their position regarding that relations? All the polls show that President Obama's uh, initiative to normalize relations with Cuba has been very popular among the American public. In Florida, the polls have shown, and we actually write in the book about how the, the uh, effort to change the policy uh, led to a kind of whole quiet lobbying campaign that included financing a series of polls that showed the president that he would be on safe ground if he, if he changed the policy, that Florida would not rebel against him, would not become a state that voted against Hillary Clinton because Obama had changed the policy. Or, or Bernie Sanders. Or Bernie Sanders, uh, whoever it might be. Hillary Clinton herself gave, went to Florida, gave a speech about lifting the embargo. She understands that there's money from very wealthy but more moderate Cuban Americans wanting to see the embargo lifted, wanting to reinvest in Cuba. And so she's gone to Florida already and said, uh, let's lift the embargo. And when she was Secretary of State, she pushed the president to lift the and embargo. And the new generation of Cubans also are more... Uh... Polling in Florida shows that the majority of Cubans younger than age, I think 35, support lifting the embargo. A small majority of, of Cuban Americans older than 60 uh, are still kind of, you know, wavering and opposed to changing the policy, but they are increasingly fewer and fewer uh, in the Florida uh, electorate, and, uh, and they are being balanced out now by other Cuban Americans who want to see the embargo lifted, want to help their families, want to return to the island, and are pressing much more actively now to have the policy change. There's the Cuba Study Group in Florida, which has been very important. There's a, a, a new a group uh, that has a kind of a, an email and, and website presence called uh, At Cuba Now. Uh, they are pushing, they're a Cuban American group pushing to have the embargo lifted. So yeah, I think you have a, a variety of forces and the more corporate interests that travel to Cuba, that follow Airbnb and Google and um, the hotels, some of the, yes. and the carnival cruise lines that are going to start uh, bringing ships to Cuba. Um, as those business interests start to go to Cuba and take advantage of the new regulations that President Obama uh, has made that allows them to actually set up infrastructure in Cuba, not actually invest in businesses, but to set up a presence, warehouses, offices, etc. 
as they go there and they see the business opportunities, as they work out what's possible with the Cuban authorities, they're going to bring much more pressure on the Republicans uh, to go ahead and, and, and lift the embargo. What are the largest or the biggest hurdles from the U.S. regarding uh, the normalization of relations? Now they have already reestablished diplomatic relations. What do you think are the biggest hurdles from the U.S. side? And what are the biggest hurdles from the Cuban side? Well, the Cubans have been very vocal, and Raul Castro has been very clear. We can have normal diplomatic relations, but gee, we can't really have normal relations when you control a whole swath, a whole section of the island at Guantanamo base uh, that we don't want you to control. And they say that they torture there. And you have a torture center there, and, and we'd like to see this base closed and return to our sovereignty. This is sovereign Cuban territory, and we would like it back. We are still facing, this is Raul's position, we are still facing democracy promotion programs fueled and funded by USAID, which are essentially kind of quasi-covert operations uh, to still try and push Cuba towards uh, more democracy. No independent sovereign country wants to tolerate those kinds of programs. Those programs are actually financed by the U.S. Congress and mandated by the Helms-Burton law. And so as long as that law is in place, it's very difficult to overturn it. Um, uh, and the Cubans would like a, a whole series of other kind of smaller changes. Uh, Compensation to, for the... Uh, well, the, the Cubans argue that they should be compensated for the embargo, but the, of course the U.S. position is that, that the U.S. should be pro uh, compensated to, for the... From, from the expropriations. Uh, expropriations of houses and businesses and U.S. lands and corporate uh, facilities that took place after the revolution. Those are sticky and tricky uh, items to negotiate, but the positive thing is that the United States and Cuba are negotiating them under a new rubric of respect, of uh, a much more calm situation, of kind of a lifting at the, of, of the shadow that the United States has cast uh, in terms of Cuba's national security for all these years. And this is the most important thing. From the United States' point of view, you know, they'd like to see the Cubans just up and abdicate the, the Castro, Castro's in power. Uh, and have free elections. And that is not going to happen. Che Guevara told a, a Kennedy aide all the way back in 1961 that Cuba's system of governance was not going to be on the negotiating table, and it never has been. So it's going to be up to the Cubans uh, to evolve their own political system, not up to the United States of America. And finally, finally, Peter, is this whole thing could have an impact in relations between the U.S. and the rest of Latin America? Well, it already has. The rest of Latin America has been overwhelmingly positive about these changes. Uh, and once Guantanamo is given back to the Cubans, then you have, you don't have the Panama Canal Zone as an issue anymore, you don't have Guantanamo as an issue anymore, you don't have those same historic issues of, of intervention, of occupation uh, that have dominated kind of the imperial position of the United States towards the rest of the region. I think this is going to, long, going to go a long way into bringing the United States and Latin America way into the modern world and making that kind of imperial past a, a part of our history when rather than going, our future. When are we going to see the new edition uh, in the new stands and in, in Mexico? When? Uh, the book in Spanish is being released at the Guadalajara Book Fair uh, the first week of December in Mexico. Uh, so it'll be available then. I'm looking forward to bringing copies to Cuba, uh, where obviously people have a great interest. Uh, and it'll be available very soon. I think it could be ordered now in Spanish by anybody who wants to read it and in Spanish. And in the U.S.? This is now a landing in the bookstores right now, the new edition. Um, it ends with the raising of the flag in Havana by John Kerry. Uh, and so it's complete. It tells, more, uh, it tells the story of more than 50 years of secret dialogue between the United States and Cuba that eventually brought us to this very day of normal diplomatic relations. Well, congratulations once more, Peter, and thanks very much for joining us. That's always a pleasure, Jorge.